Okay, hello and welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Working with Contractors and Suppliers the Easy Way. My name is Neil Cook. Uh, my email, Twitter handle and my forum name are there. Uh, you can contact me on any of those. Um, if you have technical questions, the best place to go really is the forum. So if you go to forum.onshape.com, uh, assuming you have an Onshape account already, then you can uh, ask any technical questions and they will get answered extremely quickly. Okay, so for today's webinar, I would encourage everybody to ask as many questions as they like. In the GoToWebinar control panel, you can enter uh, your question in there and hit send. And I will, I will occasionally stop to answer a question, or if not, I'll hang around at the end to answer any questions that, that may come up. Okay, so for today's agenda, uh, talking about working with contracts and suppliers, we are going to look at some results of a, of a recent survey that was done by, uh, by a company called Fictive. Uh, then we'll look at why those survey results are important and what the relevance of those are. And that's all down to do with uh, sharing files between all your external contractors and suppliers. Then we'll take a look at how we do it in Onshape. We'll look at how we do document sharing and collaboration. Uh, and really what the benefits of that, how easy it is, um, how you can use it in conjunction with a lot of your your customers, your suppliers, your contractors, and kind of streamline the whole process of um, outsourcing any kind of design or manufacturing. And then just five minutes at the end, uh, we'll take a look at real-time analytics in Onshape Enterprise. Uh, this is a new premium edition of Onshape that we released just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and this is has some extra capabilities in able to manage uh, and you know all your extended um, design team throughout all different companies. So we'll take a, a quick look at that. Okay. Now a recent survey was done by a company called Fictive, um, and it's their the state of the hardware report for 2018. Now, Fictive are a virtual manufacturing platform and they connect uh, product developers with manufacturers uh, through this through this common platform. So if you're needing um, short runs of CNC parts or, or um, 3D printed parts or even more production level parts, you can use their platform to find manufacturers quickly. So as part of their expanded network of people that they know, companies they're in contact with, they sent out this survey asking per pertinent questions about you know, how they source, how they create, how they manufacture, uh, what they're referring to as hardware, but basically anything physical that you know mechanical engineers would do in Onshape, for example. And they got a pretty good reply. So a re representative sample size there of just over 1,100 respondents, which for a survey is really pretty good, and over 72 industries as well. So it really is a very wide spectrum of information, and it probably makes it more accurate than you, than you might expect. Now, out of those, they're saying uh, 1,039 developers, they're calling product design, product develop, development companies, product development people uh, as developers. And manufacturers they're referring to is really kind of uh, not necessarily job shops, but people who will focus on the creation of the production of a part or uh, or an assembly or, or so on. At the bottom there is the link to the um, to the actual report if you wanted to make a note of that and actually take a look at it yourself. Uh, but again, I've got a lot of the information in here already, and it's some very interesting results. Okay, so. What they found with the survey is that really speed is the priority that people are focusing on. So they have, um, they reckon 71% of product developers uh, use external shops in development. Now, there are some caveats to that. It's most, a lot of that is in, in prototype. So, uh, you know, their own, perhaps their own internal manufacturing is busy doing production parts. They want to do some quick prototype parts. They will sub it out. Uh, but you'll see that 36% of people are saying they exclusively use external contractors or manufacturers. And again, that's probably because they don't have any in-house manufacturing. So there's a, a nice mix. But the important thing is here is that, you know, there's nobody who's doing anything, everything in-house. 
you know, there's always some level of uh, outsourcing to contractors, to manufacturers, uh, and so on. Now, we're talking about speed being the priority, again, probably a lot during the prototype uh, phase, but so 27% of, of product developers report that they usually or always pay fees to expedite delivery, to get things done faster. Um, obviously, this is a service that the manufacturing people there are talking to. Uh, you know, if you pay more, they'll bump you up the queue. So people are seeing the benefits of getting things manufactured quickly in order to do design iterations, get the product out the door, get the, get the prototype stage finished and through to production as fast as possible. And of course, that makes perfect sense. Uh, but people are willing to pay that extra premium in order to get things done faster. Now, what it found is because external contractors, suppliers, they are by the very nature external, they're not in the same building. So it's difficult perhaps to speak to somebody, get hold of somebody, uh, convey your design intent. And in fact, it's saying here that 66% of people doing product design experienced a miscommunication uh, with regard to the design intent of a part. So they've um, either during a review process or they've got the first the first off of the of a, of a batch that's come back and it's wrong, or perhaps uh, you know some tolerances on a CNC machine part are are measured from the wrong place or it's out of tolerance. So there's some miscommunication going on there. And from the manufacturer's standpoint, they said they got uh, you know three quarters of those people are saying that there is a similar miscommunication. So it's kind of a common theme that goes on. You know, there's no unless you've worked with somebody, you know, for many years on very similar products and so that both parties understand exactly what a product does, how it's manufactured, um, then, you know, new suppliers, new parts working together is kind of getting some kind of miscommunication and a bit of a, uh, uh, like a robot, a bit of gridlock going on with the, with the actual communication to make sure that parts are manufactured correctly. And they're also finding that collaboration is difficult as well. Now, collaboration meaning, uh, you know, doing design reviews, uh, perhaps a manufacturing person being able to edit a design, perhaps a draft, for example, for molding. Uh, doing that kind of collaboration is difficult. So that 29% of manufacturers are saying that a lot of the parts aren't manufacturable. So there's always going to be some kind of design iteration required. And what's the best way and best process to get that information back to the original designer in order then to go through a like a closed loop feedback loop to try and uh, get a part more easy to manufacture or manufacture at all um, so that's something which is quite high no 30 percent is it's a lot uh, although 10 percent saying that never happens and you know i find that quite a little bit difficult to believe and perhaps those people are the ones that have worked uh, in partnership with somebody for many, many years, and they know the kinds of products that they're creating. Uh, on the left there, it's saying that 30% are always getting feedback on the parts and 7% never get any feedback. So again, the, uh, the results of the survey are a little bit vague there, so it's not sure whether the 13% um, are doing bad designs, they don't understand the manufacturing process, uh, and the 7% never get feedback because they're perhaps they're, they're great at design, they're great at manufacturing, or perhaps the manufacturer they're working with is not very responsive and just builds it as is. You know, if you sub it off to a different country, uh, you know, they might just get the drawing and just say, okay, whatever, that's how it should be made. I'll make it and ship it back. And if it's wrong, it's your fault. So those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, clearly there is a bit of disconnect between design and manufacturing, and they're actually getting a lot of uh, issues relating to both uh, collaboration and communication uh, relating to this whole design process. Now, one of the questions they ask is what kind of methods or what media do you use to actually convey information from one from one entity, being your own company, to another entity? And the issue here is that manufacturing still runs on email. Uh, you can see clearly there from that graph that email on the right-hand side is that product development people are using email, 93%. Manufacturing people are using email, 94%. And there's a, there's a slew of other types of activity there. You can see, for example, there's file sharing tools like um, uh, like Dropbox. Uh, there's obviously phone conversations and video calls, 
there is um, uh, text, you know, by 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 cell phone, um, and there is um, video calls, which oops, sorry, and um, video calls, which is obviously what we're doing right now, and it makes it um, a lot easier to convey um, what's what's going on. And uh, now, clearly, looking at email, it is still very popular, and really, email is is has really kind of ground everything to a halt. You know, email hasn't really changed in 20, 30 years. You know, it's got a little bit better. Email clients have got a little bit better and easier to use, but there's still plenty of uh, issues relating to email. So so why do people use email? Um, they use it because it's easy. You know, it's fast, it's convenient. Uh, it's documented. So once you send or receive an email, unless you physically delete it, you've always got a copy of it. So it's traceable, you can search through them, it's permanent. Um, attachment friendly, files, links, images, um, maybe not always, uh, because obviously emails have um, attachment limits. So once you exceed that, obviously it's not going to send, then you've got to waste time breaking files up into smaller chunks or, th or finding other ways to, to send emails, you know. You can get zip programs which which split large files into smaller smaller files, and they have to recom recompile them again at the other end. So, not necessarily attachment friendly. Uh, ubiquitous, yes, of course, everybody, pretty much everybody who's over a certain age has got a got an email. Certainly, everybody in business, and again, for everyone in business, really, you know, it's required, and you know, everybody is expected to have an email, and everybody pretty much does. Uh, asynchronous. You know, you're not waiting on something. It will just appear in your inbox. Uh, it's historical. You can create conversations. So, you know, once you do a, a reply all, you know, I know people do it, but please don't. If you do a reply all, then uh, everybody's going to get um, um, brought into a conversation and then can kind of trawl through the uh, through the information and see what's going on. So perhaps not the easiest way to navigate a um a conversation you know the, uh, there are more modern tools like slack for example you know we use slack a lot at uh, on shape where you can create channels and it's got a history you can look through uh, what's going on and you know it's just a nice and easier way to navigate information and of course email is detailed as well because of course you can write war and peace in an email and you can have as much attachments details anything you want can be uh, added to an email but one of the problems with emails is really the information is siloed. We've talked about attachment sizes. Yes, that's fine. But also the information is siloed. So whoever you send it to, it sits in their email box. Anybody else in the organization can't get hold of it. So if perhaps that um, that person's on vacation or or you know is out out, out of the office uh, at a customer site, then there's no way anybody can find out any information because that is stored within that email and it's locked within there unless you have their password. Okay. Now, one of the reasons why email is so bad is not because what we've mentioned already because of file attachment sizes and not being able to get into a conversation, but it's really when we're talking about CAD data, it's really about the duplication of CAD data. You know, if you're sharing data with other people and you're using um, what we refer to as an old CAD, CAD system, which runs on files, then you've got multiple options to, to send information to a, a contractor or supplier. Uh, and the issue is that you're just making copies and copies and copies of files that are sitting in FTP silos or in email or on USB sticks left around the office, left on the, left on the train. Uh, you've got Dropbox, you know, everyone has, a lot of people use Dropbox and other types of file sharing services. But again, there's information lying in files everywhere. So essentially what happens is if one of the four designs at the top, and we've got the four suppliers at the bottom, they've created their own copies of a CAD file and they decide to use email. So once they've uh, created an email and attached the file, there's now a copy of that file in that email. When it send it to one or more people, people, sorry, then there will be um, a copy of the CAD file in their inboxes, and in order for them to work on it, they will uh, take that file and put it on their desktop. 
So now there is, uh, you know, of the original CAD file, there's at least one, two, three, four other copies of that same file floating around in the ether. Now things kind of get compound and get worse is that if you then try and start using different uh, methods, depending on what the manufacturer wants to wants to see, what what process they want to use. So uh, you know, once you then use Dropbox, it's a copy in the Dropbox silo, is a copy on their desktop, and really before you know it, there is literally just complete file chaos, and there are just files everywhere. Now this is one of the inherent issues with running with a file-based system. It might not just be CAD. It might be, you know, Microsoft Word, or it could be a PDF. You know, I mean, how many times have you created a uh, a Word document and you've sent it to somebody else, and they've made some changes, they send it back, you change the name to Final, send it on, someone makes more changes, and suddenly you get a Word document that says, uh, you know, specification Final, 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 because there's been so many iterations to the same file that there's just copies everywhere, and nobody knows who has the latest version. So this creates a number of, of issues. It's both in errors, in that you're getting, you know, who's got the latest version. If it's manufacturing, are people manufacturing the correct version? You know, did, did, they, did they miss the email you sent them last night? Uh, and therefore, they're machining from the wrong part. Uh, the security issues, because there's files everywhere. If your intellectual property is sensitive, and you don't want to get into the wrong hands, then, you know, there's files uh, literally distributed everywhere of your uh, valuable IP. And of course, there's costs as well. If things are manufactured wrong or, uh, you know, or you lose or you lose files, you lose IP, uh, then there's going to be costs related to that as well. So it's a very difficult thing that we've just kind of got used to over the years, creating lots of files and distributing them in the easiest possible fashion which which is email okay so what we did at on shape was to focus mainly on the way that we distribute files so if you've got um you know on shape is a cad system but first and foremost it's actually a data management system so rather than work on um creating files and storing them in a PDM system, we decided very early on to create a, a database and store all the information in one centralized database. So essentially what that means is that when somebody first signs into OneShape, they are presented with a uh, essentially what is the data management related to OneShape. So you get a list of documents, and then once you click on the document, it then opens it in on shape. So it's kind of like the reverse of what you would have with old CAD and PDM, where you uh, bolt the PDM on as, a, as an afterthought almost to manage the files that are created by the CAD system. But you open the CAD system first, then you check out the files from the PDM system. So it's kind of uh, on shape does it the opposite way around. The benefit of this is that you can get multiple people working on the same database or the same document at the same time. Uh, and so from a team design standpoint, you know, it's a very efficient way of working. So you don't need to check files in, in and out. You don't have to wait while somebody finishes on a design because the design is locked. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, everything you do is real time and, and works out very easily. So if we put this in the context of um, design and manufacturers being a, being totally separate, then because everything here is in the cloud, there is no worries about transferring data from one location to another because all the data resides in one location and that's on the cloud in the database. And all people are doing here is accessing it through a browser or through a mobile device to get to the same information. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at how we do uh, document sharing uh, in Onshape, and then take a look at some of the other things related to this as well. So, as I've already mentioned, there are no files; everything is data uh, running a database database uh, on Amazon Web Services. So it's very easy to get hold of, and because there is only actually one version of that document, and that's the single source of truth. So nobody needs to worry about whether it's the same version, who's got the latest version. Um, you know, if somebody overwrite. If somebody got a copy of it, if somebody make overwriting your changes, 
uh, everything is recorded and stored in this very in this single document. And sharing it with external people is just like Google Docs. I mentioned earlier about the Microsoft Word documents and having final, final, final after it. Of course, Google Docs revolutionized that by having a single document in the cloud that everybody could edit at the same time. And if you imagine that uh, Onshape works the same as Google Docs, then it will suddenly become very clear about how, how it's working. And if you're working with a supplier who you've never worked with before, then it's nice because there is no account required. As soon as you add their email address, then uh, they will be sent an email with a link. And once that link is clicked, they will then open on shape. Okay. And then and we'll see how that, uh, how that looks in a moment. Okay. So when you first uh, sign into on shape, here's the documents page. And let me just open one of these documents. Now, at the moment, this is a, a design that I'm working on by myself. I could be working with a, a team internal or a team external to to, uh, to this design. So if I uh, share this document, okay, again, just clicking the share button in the top right corner, again, very much like Google Docs, then you can see at the moment, there's only myself who can edit it. Uh, because I'm using Onshape Professional here, you can see it's owned by, uh, by a company, but in essence, uh, only myself and the company administrator can currently see this document. Now then, if I were to add somebody to this, then I could just type in their email address, uh, in which case it's myself, and then specify what you can do with this. So uh, they we can transfer ownership, so they suddenly become the owner. Uh, you can edit or you can view. If you're sending it to a supplier, then it makes sense that you set it to view only and perhaps comment only capabilities as well. Okay, so what happens there is when I when I share that document, then they will immediately get the email, click the link, and the document will open. Now, if they have their own uh, Onshape account, it's still view only, but they can make comments on it and send them, and and whenever they make comments on it, it'll, those will appear immediately in your session of Onshape. Now, if at some time later you decide that from doing an RFQ with a supplier, you suddenly want to work with that supplier, you sign an agreement, uh, you can then specify export capabilities. So if they need to do, um, if they use Mastercam, for example, and they want to machine the parts, they will need export capabilities. One of the nice things about how we do this is that, again, you, you may have come across this situation when you're working with somebody external who doesn't use the same CAD system as you and they're saying can you send me a step file can you send me a parasolid file can you send me a dxf and then later you get a phone call saying i can't open this file i can't do whatever i need to do so or can you send me another different format the way onshape works is that the person at the other end decides which format they want to export in so it gives you so you don't have to, you're out of the loop. You don't have to concern yourself with what system they're using or what inputs they can read. You just give them export capabilities and they can do that themselves. So again, it just streamlines that whole process of getting the right type of CAD file to the right person. And of course, if you then actually trust them implicitly, you can specify that they have edit capabilities, but you might want to turn off copy. You don't want them making copies. Uh, you don't want them sharing it with other people. Uh, you certainly don't want them deleting it. So you could allow them to edit a document, but not make copies, not share it onto anybody else. And imagine from a, uh, a file and email standpoint, of course, they can make as many copies as they want. They can hand it out to all the friends. There's nothing stopping them. Okay. So this gives you the extra security when you're sharing documents with other people. Okay. So I just go ahead and update those. Update those. And you can see that you can you can share it with the team. So you might have teams of contractors or suppliers. You've got your entire company. Um, if you know they don't have uh, on shape, you can use this uh, this link capability. And what I'll do here, just to demonstrate this now, I'll just open another window of um, Chrome and just run that um, that URL. Now, if this person does not have a on shape account then this is exactly what they will see. So there's a create account and sign-in buttons if they want to sign in, but they get the full 
um, capabilities of well view capabilities I should say of Onshape. Now you can you can spin and rotate it. You can look at drawings and that kind of thing. Um, if you wanted to, um, you know, you can take measurements. So if I click from here to here, it's going to give me the, the measurement down the bottom right hand corner. There's 40 mils. So for a quoting standpoint, it's very useful capability to be able to do some rough uh, estimates of um, of size and material required and operations that are required as well. But this is not just a viewer. Notice as well that I've just opened a browser. I've not had to install any proprietary viewing software. I've not had to download anything. Just open the link in, in a browser. But what you'll see is that, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. So you can see it's actually the CAD system. So you can do things like, like motion, which you can't do with viewing, cap viewing tools. Uh, and, you know, no effort has been required from uh, from anybody from the person sending the document to the person receiving the document there's been no uh, extra effort required okay so we have uh, so that is uh, shared i'm going to remove that and you can remove somebody immediately by pressing that x let's just just go ahead and close that and let's see if we can get this uh, this to work Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so so I'm running running this on my uh, on my iPhone. Um, I mentioned previously that uh, on Shape has um, you know you can run it on uh, a browser, Windows, Mac, Linux, Chromebook, but it also works on uh, iOS and uh, and Android as well. So you can download a specific app to run that run that. Um, run and shape on what you'll see is that when i go to uh, documents that are shared with me i can see there's the sheet metal door hinge and as soon as i click on that you'll see my face appears in this document here so even uh, so i'm logged into two, two different accounts here but you can see that i've now got the um, the full capabilities of the cad system uh, being displayed on the phone there and what's really different here is if you've got edit capabilities there are there are things that you lots of things you can do you know if, if i move this over you can see that's going to move on over there as well but you can also use something called follow mode so by double clicking on somebody's face that appears at the top uh, as you move it around on one screen so i'm moving the uh, the uh, the parts around or the view around on the on the uh, on the cell phone and that's then uh, updating on the um, on, on the browser. So for doing design reviews, it's great. You know, you don't have to use um, you know screen sharing technologies like we are with GoToMeeting. All you need is a phone and uh, your on shape session running to be actually work uh, in, uh, to work side by side. Um, and likewise, if if I let's just do it the other way around. So so looking from the um, from the um, from the browser to the phone, you can see that actually shows where my cursor is as well. So if you really like wanting to point to something, uh, then you can see that directly on the on the mobile phone there as well. Okay, now then, what happens if you want to make changes? What we have here in in the in the cell phone is a um, is the full CAD system, so you can make whatever changes you need to uh, within. Uh, within a phone within a different browser anything that you need to do so for example if i um if i come over here and i want to uh, i want to create a sketch on this face here and let's just do a a simple center circle let's just draw it about there okay and our dimensions and uh, oops and now dimensions and so on then uh, then i can do so there's uh, so there's the sketch and now I'm going to extrude that sketch. I'll pick the sketch and let's go through all. Oops, sorry, I want to remove. So I'm making a cut. And it's going to and it's going to cut through just this top face. So this is just a simple, a simple feature. What you'll see is I've got the full capabilities there of creating the CAD data in, in the cell phone, but as soon as I press OK you'll see that the whole appears in the CAD system as well. So because we're all looking at the same database, everything changes in real time. So there's no waiting for files to be checked in or anything like that. And likewise, if I was to come over here and let's say, um, 
uh, move face. So I decide I want to, you know, pull this face up by, by so much. Okay, and as soon as I press OK, okay, you're going to see that appear on the on the mobile phone as well. So there's a lot of, um, if you imagine teams either co-located in this when the same location or across multiple sites, whether it be suppliers, you can give them this edit capabilities and you can see exactly what's going on. Now the nice thing is that everything that you do is stored and uh, so you can see here that the move face was done by by Neil on the left. Um, the insert, the sketch and the extrude was done by Neil on the right. So you can you can undo any of these at any time. So for example, if I right click here and say restore that, uh, it'll restore, um, well, it's basically done an undo, but you get a full list of every um, everything that's happened within that document since it was, since it was first created. So there's no worries about things being um, overwritten. There's no things worry about things being out of date. Everything is always going to be uh, up to date, uh, no matter how many people are working on it. Okay. Okay, so we've, we've looked at uh, follow mode and simultaneous editing. Um, I mentioned exporting in in any format. So, like I mentioned, once that once that person um, uh, can export, and in fact, let me just go back to that. Uh, you will see that, and let me just quit that as well while I'm at it. Okay, so you'll see that when somebody comes to uh, export, is that you can export in uh, any number of formats. Uh, a lot of the major CAD formats. Like Parasolid, uh, you can in native SolidWorks format, ACES step. Um, you can also, of course, export in STL if you want to do 3D printing. But again, from a supplier standpoint, they can just open your document and export it in whichever format they want. So you can see, for example, um, Parasolid here comes in any number of versions. So something like um, SolidWorks 20, 2012 is something like Parasolid 26 or something. So if somebody's running an old version of SolidWorks and they need to open your files, you don't have to worry about what version they can open. You can just do it from here. Oh, they sorry, they can just do it from here and choose whichever format they need. So again, it's a real, real time saver. And from a uh, commenting standpoint, you can uh, pick any geometry uh, and add a comment and then say, can, you know, can I raise this by five mil? Question mark. And if that person, especially if the person's got the document open, it will pop up straight away so you can see the comments. Uh, if they haven't got it open at the moment, they will receive an email, click on the link, it will open the document and it will open the comment there as well. So you don't have to rely on email threads to work out what's going on within uh, a comment. You can do it all directly within Onshape, and there'll be a permanent record then of all the design decisions that you've made. Okay. And last thing that we uh, um, that we could do here is, is to create versions and branch and merge. So a version is basically a um, a bookmark or a milestone of where you've got to to a certain degree. When we notice that there was a, a lot of changes within the design there, once you get to a certain uh, milestone, you can draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is this is version one. It just makes it easier to find. But from that, you can then branch into a separate workspace and do whatever changes you want. So you could do a different design scenario. You could just do, you could be defeaturing for FEA, for example, or you could have multiple team members working in separate branches, or even the suppliers working in separate branches. And then later on, you can investigate what's going on in those branches and, and cherry pick the, the best um, changes from those branches and merge them back into the main design. So all from one collaborative database and one document object, you can have multiple people working in there, creating lots of design iterations, and you've got full control over who can do what, uh, and then undo it at the end. Uh, what I didn't show there is when we are in the um, the share dialog, uh, once you finish working with a supplier, you can just click the X next to their name and they will be immediately kicked out of that document. So again, you don't have to worry about loose copies of your files hanging around or people being able to 
work on designs after the fact, you know, once they've finished working with you, click the X, they have no longer have access to that data. So from a security standpoint, it's, you know, it's almost second to none. Okay, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about Onshape Enterprise. Now, Onshape Enterprise is uh, is not for everybody. It is for uh, perhaps larger companies or companies which are growing and they have more sophisticated product design uh, and uh, outsourcing issues that they want to control and bring in-house. I want to say bring in-house, not necessarily bring the people in-house and the capabilities in-house, but being able to control the data. So what we have with uh, Onshape Professional, which we've just been looking at, is that you can share a document with um, another um, user who has Onshape, and you can see in the version history what they've been doing. But it's very difficult to keep track of um, how much work somebody's uh, put in, when they opened the document, when they when they looked at it, um, you know, what, how much basically how much effort they've put in there and also be able to secure what you do with that. Now, especially if you've uh, given them share or export permissions in a document, that kind of gives them a little bit more freedom to do what they want with your information. Um, Onshape Enterprise allows people to do that, but it also keeps a, a strict audit log of what's going on. So if there is, uh, uh, you know, some kind of, incidents and you want to investigate you've got all the information backed up that you can uh, refer to to see what's gone on within within your company and what's gone on with your data also accessing that is is uh, is very easy it's been um, done very um, very very clever the way the right way it works and adding people to a design uh, um, uh, an enterprise and then finally, just take a look at. We'll just take a look at some of the um, the analytics and the reports so it's give, that give you this kind of unprecedented visibility into your design. Okay, now what you'll find that with um, let me just start another window. Okay, now when um, when you sign into an Onshape Enterprise account, there's there's a couple of differences. One is that there is a unique domain, uh, and then there's also a, an activity feed, so you can see exactly who's been doing what on what parts. You know, immediately straight straight in front of you, so you can see that I've been working on some stuff here. Uh, Mike's been working on this drawing here, whatever it is. So you can kind of get a, an up to date view of what everybody in the team is working on. Um, but probably more importantly here is the way we uh, add users. So adding users, you literally all you need to do is add their email to add a user to the company. You can also add somebody uh, as as a guest, and that gives them that flags them as a guest, and it also means that they um, have limited access to your data. So a guest might be a, a supplier, it might be a contractor. Uh, and then from there, you would then give them specific access to individual documents or projects uh, within within enterprise. So there's a lot more control. So the difference, again, between Onshape Professional and Onshape Enterprise, when we did Onshape Professional, we were sharing the data out. Um, well, it doesn't actually really leave anywhere. It's still within the Onshape database, but you're essentially sharing access to that outside of your outside of your firewall, if you like. Um, Whereas on Chip Enterprise, for somebody to access your data, they must be invited in. So those, that's the that's one of the uh, the big differences. Okay, and then there's all kind of things like uh, project roles, so you can define, <coughs> excuse me, somebody by role or job function. And you can also specify permission schemes for what what people can do. But probably what's more important or more useful in a lot of these instances especially when working with external people, is the is the use of analytics. Okay, let's just answer a quick question here. So someone's asking, what's the best way to associate versions with serial part effectivity? Okay, Rev A for 110, Rev B for 1130, et cetera. Um, so when you, well, the best way is uh, really if you're using um on Chip Professional, there is an option to create a release. So we took a look at versions. Versions, if you like, are just, like I say, just the line in the sand. This is a milestone for a particular design. 
whereas a release is, you know, it's an official formal release procedure that's gone through a workflow. Uh, so that's the best way to uh, to do that in that you have, you know, assembly at a version, uh, sorry, a revision X uh, uses parts from these different areas in revision A, B, F, H, whatever. So when, whenever you need to find out uh, effectivity from a part, where it was used, uh, which level it was used in, uh, that is definitely the best way to go. I hope that answered the question. Okay, so let's take a look at analytics. Now, analytics gives you um, a lot of feedback about exactly what's going on uh, within the business. So we can see that there are, um, um, let me just change this over 15 days. Let's do the last 60 days there and run that. Okay, what this is, is, is doing is every time you make a design change in Onshape, it's, it's storing that version history within the document itself. So what Onshape Enterprise is doing is getting every document and every user within your enterprise and aggregating all that information to these dashboards that you can take a look at. So we can see over the last 60 days, there's been 22 users, 41 documents created, 83 versions, 34 releases, blah, blah, blah. But probably more important things like, um, you know, how many shares has there been and who have they been shared to? Uh, how many exports has there, have there been? So if you want to find out who has exported data and what data they've exported, then you've got a complete formal audit trail so you can see exactly what's going on. So this doesn't matter whether it's an employee or an external contractor or supplier, uh, you'll be able to see exactly what documents they've they've accessed, what they've exported and what formats they've exported and exactly when they did it. Okay. Now obviously once it's exported you don't know where it's gone because it's an export, but the uh, but the point is that you know um, you have a an audit trail of exactly what everybody's been doing with your data. And you can see there's things like project activity, uh, there is most active documents, there is number of releases, login locations, so you can see the team is pretty spread out. Uh, Hong Kong, some in, uh, is that Pune? Okay, so there's, there's plenty of um, activity going on uh, within this enterprise. Um, this is my location here with the big circle, so I've been very, very active there. Uh, but then you can also see by user that you've got all these individual um, user times. So, so the idea here is that you might say, okay, well, I'm paying, if you go back to the survey, I'm paying this supplier a, a premium in order for them to expedite their service. Okay, now, is it just a case of them bumping me up the priority list or is it, uh, or are they just stalling? You know, you could actually take a, a a user and see exactly what they've what they've done okay so has a contractor um, you know they've said it's going to cost so much it's going to take them two weeks did they start on it the day before it was due in um, you can get full kind of information uh, available here uh, on, on any kind of on any kind of information relating to your data so if we have a look at uh, this guy Brad over the last 30 days then we can be able to see exactly what he's been up to so in this case, he's, he's been almost 10 hours of modeling time. He's worked on six documents, the axle suspension system being the most popular one. Um, and then you can get things like feature activity to see uh, what he's been doing. You can see he's, well, he's not been doing an awful lot. So this is just a, another example of um, being able to uh, track what's going on. Now, it's not necessarily snooping. What we're doing here is looking at uh, resources and, and load balancing. You know, if there is a project which is in danger of running behind schedule, we can take a look at what other users are working on. Uh, have they? Uh, can we move some resources around? If somebody's spending too much time on one design, like this axle suspension system, do we need to ask them if they're stuck? Do they need more help? Do they need more pro? Um, resource on the process on the project so there's a lot of capabilities and information you can extract from this data and from a um, from a document access standpoint from a security and permission standpoint then uh, this might take a few moments to generate but essentially what this will do is create a nice graph showing us who has access to what documents you know because sometimes you will have um, you will have um, shared a document with somebody and perhaps you forgot to unshare it or uh, you know somebody's got 
permission to a document that they shouldn't have. So these kind these kind of graphs uh, give you information. So for, for that particular project, for example, then uh, you know these number of users have got access to. If I look at uh, Mike here. I can see exactly which access to which documents and which projects and what his total modeling time is in there. And more importantly here, again, you've got an audit trail of exactly who's got access to what documents. So from a security standpoint, it's fantastic being able to manage and control <clears throat> external con contractors and, uh, and manufacturers. Okay. So really whether you are using Onshape Professional, you know, which, um, which as it stands is a fantastic tool to be able to collaborate easily with um, people within your business, people outside your business. And then you have Onshape Enterprise, which goes that next level. Uh, like I say, it's not necessarily for every business, it all depends on, on your requirements, but that then collates all that information and gives you nice data to work on and make some very critical business decisions based on that. But in essence, because the fundamental difference between all the Onshape products and any other CAD system is the fact that we don't use CAD files. So whether you, um, you know, whether it's SolidWorks or Solid Edge or Creo or anything, all these document, all these CAD systems use files, um, and therefore they need a PDM system to be able to manage it. Um, even um, Katia V6, which is supposed to run on a database, still uses files in the background. So there is a certain amount of um, copying of files, waiting for people to finish, checking in, checking out, and that gives you a serial workflow. If you took a, take a look at any CAD vendor's website, there's probably some diagram somewhere which specifies how they compress the design cycle from concept through to manufacture. And yes, that's um, making the assumption that people are doing simulation early, people are doing, you know, rendering or documentation earlier uh, but the fact the fact of the matter is the the CAD process of designing is still very much serial if you've got more than one person working on a project now the difference there we've seen, we've seen with data uh, on shape is that because it runs on a database everybody can work at the same time so it gives you a parallel workflow and less time working so uh, in summary um, you know, we've taken a look at how we um, how we can share data easily with external contractors and suppliers as compared to the old way of doing things with email or Dropbox or whatever using files. But in essence, Onshape gives you a number of benefits on top of the uh, on top of the sharing and collaboration as well. So you know, it gives you the one place to work, one place to find and share data because everything is stored in a centralized database. Uh, one place to receive tech support, so there's no resellers, there's no passing the book. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, a lot of the hardware you run on. Uh, everything is just, um, you know, most of the time just works. And there's no unsecured intellectual property. Again, unless you specifically give somebody um, share and export permissions uh, and copy permissions, then there's no way they can actually take your data out of Onshape. So there's no, so it's perfectly secure. There's no crashes or data loss. Now this is a, a bold statement, but essentially the architecture of the cloud means that we can run multiple instances of Parasolid, for example, whereas a local install of a CAD system, if Parasolid crashes, the whole thing crashes. We just swap one out for another and you carry on regardless. No files to lose or corrupt. Every change you made is, is is saved instantaneously. There's no save button. You can see the perfect the version. Uh, there's no license keys or, or floating licenses or any of that kind of thing. All you need is a log, uh, an account, nothing to install because it's just through a browser. And we do upgrades every three weeks. So about every three weeks, you get a dozen or so new features. In fact, uh, one should go out today, actually. Um, and that is... Um, you know, everybody's always on the same version of the CAD, so there's no version or software compatibility issues ever. You know, everybody's upgraded at the same time. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you for attending the webinar, and I will stay around for uh, 10 minutes or so to ask any questions. If you have any questions in there, please type them into the GoToWebinar question panel. If not, uh, I will thank you for your time, and have a nice day.